Okay. All right. Second Corinthians chapter 10, please. Second Corinthians chapter 10. I want to read from verse seven, verse seven to the end of the chapter. Second Corinthians 10 verse seven. It says, do ye look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trust to himself that he is Christ's, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ's, even so are we Christ's. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. For his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such an one think this, that such as we are in word by letters when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. But we will not boast of things without our measure but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reached not unto you, but we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you, according to our rule, abundantly. To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. And again, God always blesses the reading of his precious word. And we'll do so this morning. And uh, this morning, the theme, the, 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 the title, if you like, that's going to be uh, before us is the foolishness of comparing ourselves. Those that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. So I want us to keep that in mind as we look at this section. And he begins in, in verse seven. And of course, remember, he's He's really now dealing with his adversaries, these opponents of the gospel uh, that have infiltrated the assembly in Corinth and began to try to undermine Paul's apostolic authority. And now he's dealing with them. And, uh, and so that's what we're dealing with in this section, really. He's dealing with them. And so he'll make a lot of uh, statements that really give us an insight into where these people were at. And where the, where the Corinthians that had been swayed by their influence, and not everybody, just a minority, but some had been swayed by their influence, where they were at in their thinking. And so verse 7 says, do you look on things after the outward appearance? And it would seem that one of the things the Corinthians were very prone to do was to judge a man by whether or not he had a commanding presence whether he was impressive in eloquence or had great powers of logic. So they were very much influenced by outward appearance, what a man looked like, uh, how he conducted himself, how he carried himself. They were swayed by this rather than by inward reality. And of course, uh, they weren't the first and they won't be the last to be guilty of this. Uh, even the great Samuel, the prophet, made that mistake uh, when he went to the house of Jesse looking for a replacement for King Saul, who, by the way, as far as outward appearance, 
was quite stunning. He was head and shoulders above his contemporaries. And so he looked good on the outside. But as we know from the experience of reading the life of Saul, uh, the outward appearance did not match any inner reality. And so this is what the Lord said to Samuel as he's looking at uh, the sons of Jesse and uh, he's impressed by their outward appearance. And this is 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. And this is what he says, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And it's interesting how so often the people that God has used uh, throughout church history have not exactly been uh, the most handsome cookies on the planet. Uh, men like John Wesley, uh, they say was about five foot, maybe not quite that. Uh, William Wilberforce, another uh, man who was very short in stature. And, and so often, uh, Spurgeon, uh, again, was uh, somebody who was a rather plump individual. Uh, uh, so as we look at church history, Harry Ironside, uh, bald spectacles and chubby, you know, I mean, these are not exactly what the world would hold up as their uh, heroes, uh, but they were greatly used of God. And so the danger in Corinth is that they were very swayed by the outward appearance. And they viewed Paul as though uh, the, these opponents, as though he was a lion when he was away from them because of his writings, but a lamb when he was present. And they were charging him with inconsistency. He's one thing in his letters. In his letters, he comes across as somebody very powerful. But when you see him, well, he ain't much to look at. He's, he's not very significant. And uh, so they were, were looking at these things from a very external perspective point of view. And then they also were making a charge and they were saying basically that they were really Christ's representatives and not this insignificant man. And so they talk about, again, in verse seven, if any man trusted to himself that he is Christ. And so these opponents claimed to be Christ's in a very special sense. Uh, not that they were they were claiming to be just believers in Christ, that, that lovely term that is unique uh, to the church age. He wasn't saying that they were in Christ like, uh, like any believer, or even that they were part of the Christ party. Uh, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, as the assembly there was very easily swayed uh, by influential uh, people, uh, they kind of were in danger of dividing along party lines on the ones who they followed. And so 1 Corinthians 1.12, now this I say that every one of you says, I am of Paul, I am, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. So again, they're not even saying that they were part of this special Christ party here. What they were claiming is that they were Christ's special servants, or if you like, apostles of Christ, and stood on a much higher plane than the Apostle Paul himself. And so they're making this claim. If a man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ's. And notice he says in verse 8, for though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, because he had received a commission from the risen glorified Christ. And so if, we, if we're boasting about who we are and our authority, he said, well, actually, I can boast of a greater authority than you because I actually received my commission from a Christ in glory, a risen glorified Christ. And so he did have great authority that was given to him by the Lord. And so he said, if, if you want to get down to boasting, now again, we're going to see, that was not what Paul wanted, but because they were boasting, he had to, as it were, establish his credentials as greater than theirs. And it wasn't an idle boast in any way. So he says, for though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, 
I should not be ashamed. So Paul tells us that the, the authority that had been given him to the Gentiles to be this great apostle of the risen, glorified head of the church, that part of his brief was the whole idea of edification, building up the people of God, building up the saints. That was what he was to use his authority for. That's what he wanted to use that authority for, was to edify, not to destroy people, not for your destruction, or uh, the word destruction there is literally not for tearing down. Uh, in other words, his whole purpose of his, his apostolic ministry was to build up and not to tear down. And so that's how he wielded his authority. And again, he's going to repeat it at the end of the letter. Just look, notice, please. Uh, so we see this chapter 13 of 2 Corinthians in verse 10. Therefore, I write these things being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. And so he's, he's no desire of destroying anybody or destroying anybody's faith. He doesn't want to do that. He wants to build up. And uh, that's what he wants to use his authority to. And he did it freely without being ashamed of it. And uh, in a sense, uh, he's involved in a warfare. We learned that last time. And he is pulling down uh, every stronghold, every argument, every pretension, every false reasoning that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. Uh, he's doing that. But with a purpose of building up and establishing people in Christ. And sometimes in order to establish people in Christ, you've got to pull down the false ideas before you can give them the, the truth, the, the true thing. Uh, and so he's, he's doing that. Now, I want to just say this too. It's very easy to be involved in a ministry that tears down. But it's much more challenging to build up the saints, much more challenging. And uh, there's a something in all of us, and, and certainly our assemblies, we're very prone to this, to have what I call armchair critics. And uh, they love to tell everything that's wrong about our meetings, about our leadership, about our teaching, about, and they're very good at that, they're very good at it, and yet, my question would be, well, what are you doing to fix the problem? You know, it's, it's easy to point out a problem. It's another thing to solve the problem and, and to come up with something uh, that's edifying, that can help, that can be positive. And so Paul's opponents were tearing down his work, <laughs> and they were trying to do that so they could grab it for themselves. But the Apostle Paul he was tearing down false reasonings, false ideas, and then building the saints up in their most holy faith and particularly in Christ. And it's very interesting as we've gone through this epistle, um, even though he's been exposing error and falsehood, it's amazing how quickly he brings us back to Christ. When we're talking about giving and their uh, and the whole principles behind it. He's quick to tell us about the Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. He's quick to remind us of the fact that thanks be to God for his uh, amazing gift, right? And, and so what we find is that, that even in his teaching, uh, even when he's pulling down false ideas, He's so quick to bring Christ into the picture in a very edifying way. And so we need to learn a lot from his approach. And so what he's saying is, really, my ministry as an apostle is the whole idea of building people up, building them up on a right foundation, building them up on Christ. And so then he says, um, verse 9, that I might not seem as, it, as if I would terrify you by letters. Again, he's not using his authority uh, in an abusive way. Yes, his letters were written in boldness to correct the behavior of some in the church. And he was using his authority uh, in a definite way. But he, his purpose was, again, to pull down these false ideas and, and to, to uh, get the Christians on a solid footing. And so, again, he's not doing this because he wants to, uh, to terrify them in any way. 
Uh, and then in verse 10, it says, his letters say they are weighty and powerful. But his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. So again, we're, we're permitted to listen in to the charge which was being made against the apostle. His opponents charged him with writing threatening letters. They said, on the other hand, he, he can write these powerful letters, but his bodily presence is, is weak. And by the way, the word uh, weighty here is, um, uh, as they talk about his letters, they say a weighty. That word uh, is translated in other places as grievous. For instance, Paul used it himself. It's a Greek word, barus. And in Acts 20, 29, he, talks, he warns the elders at Ephesus that grievous wolves would come in. And that's the same word that's translated here, weighty. Uh, and so uh, they're accusing him of writing letters that are, that are severe, that are oppressive, that are grievous, all of these things. And yet in contrast with his, the power of his letters, they're saying that he himself is weak. Now let's uh, think about this idea that his bodily presence was weak and his speech contemptible. Certainly, uh, all he endured would tell us that he wasn't weak physically. He could not have been a weakling to have endured all that he suffered. Now, no question that his presence would have, bodily presence would have been affected by all his sufferings. Uh, and we, we don't have much description of what Paul looked like, except in 200 AD, uh, there, there is a document describing Paul, and this is what they described him like. And again, we don't know how accurate this is, but they said that he was a small man, because his name, Paul, means little. So that would seem to fit. So in, in other words, he's not a big, tall guy. He's a small fellow. He's bald, and he had a big hooked nose. That's what they described him like. So you get this, this picture. And then added to that, over his years of service, he'd been badly knocked about in the course of his missionary activities, beatings, hardships, no doubt had left a mark on his physical form. Uh, it, it's quite evident he was no handsome bow in any way. Uh, his features had been burned uh, by the, the, the heat of many a Syrian sun, uh, bitten by many a cold night's frost. And then there, there's evidence that he was a very sick man. We're going to read about it. He's got this thorn in the flesh that we're going to read about uh, later on. That was uh, a constant uh, issue that he dealt with. And then there's some implications that he may have had a serious eye problem. We don't know for sure, but, but the fact that the Galatians were willing to pluck out their eyes and give them to him may indicate that he had some severe eye problem. He talked about writing with large letters, uh, again, maybe indicating something of that. And then in terms of his speech, they said, uh, he don't look much. Yeah, he writes these very weighty letters, but he don't look much. And his speech is contemptible. Uh, and uh, we do know something about his speech uh, from his own words, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1. Let's just look back there because we want to just see something here, which I think is important for us to understand. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 1. Let me read from, uh, yeah, it says, I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And so again, we might say that, um, that he understood that nothing would have appealed more to the Corinthians than Greek oratory and uh, kind of clever language uh, 
And so he, it seems that he deliberately, consciously preached the message of the cross with the simple, simplest and plainest language, but dependent entirely on divine power, so that they didn't trust in the wisdom and eloquence of men, but in the power of God. So it, was, it seems to me that, that he, he was very conscious of how he presented his message to them, knowing who they were and knowing what they would have ran, ran after. And, and yet when we read his sermons elsewhere, for instance, in Antioch in Pisidia in Acts chapter 13, on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17 in Athens, you cannot deny that he could be eloquent when he wanted to be. And uh, certainly a very capable, and we know from his letters, uh, there's incredible eloquence in his letters. Uh, you read uh, Romans, the, the incredible logic and thought flow in the epistle to Romans is masterful. And so what we're saying is they were criticizing him, him and they're saying that his bodily presence was weak, his, uh, was weak, his speech was contemptible, but, but he uh, was very careful uh, in the way that he presented Christ in a simple way to them, because he knew how easy they could be carried away with human eloquence. And he wanted to depend on divine power rather than human eloquence. And it's amazing how human eloquence can influence people. Uh, you only have to look at Adolf Hitler. His speeches hoodwinked a nation. Winston Churchill, who was definitely not a godly man, uh, his speeches put backbone into a nation, right? So speech can be a very powerful thing. Eloquence can be a very powerful thing. And Paul says, I actually shunned that because I was depending on the power of God through the work of the Spirit of God to take the simple, simple message of the gospel and apply it to the hearts of men. So verse 11, he says, let such and one think this, that such as we are in word by letters when we're absent, such will we be also indeed when we're present. So what he's saying is anyone at Corinth who reckons Paul to be a different man, and this is what they're accusing him of inconsistency, a different man when he's absent from what he will be when present has another lesson to learn, for he will prove to all that his writings and his deeds are in full agreement. And I want you to notice the, the contrast here. In fact, uh, there is what, what uh, scholars call a, a, a chiastic structure in these verses. And it's kind of like a cross where you have a kind of contrasting ideas. So you've got in this verse, you've got absence, uh, absent and present set in contrast. And you have word and deed set in, content, in contrast. His letters say they are weighty and powerful. Sorry, verse, I'm wrong verse, verse 11. But such so one think that such as we are in word by letters, when we're absent, such we will be also indeed when we're present. So there's a kind of little structure in there contrasting these things. Absent, present, word, deed. Those reading these words can be assured he would have said the same things if present. However, in the providence of God, he was absent. By the way, aren't you thankful that he was absent? Because, because he was absent, we have this letter. Uh, we wouldn't be studying this letter today if he'd been present. But he's telling us if he would have been present, he would have said the same thing to them. But thankfully, he was absent. And his words have been preserved for us in permanent form. And we're very thankful for that. So we get to verse 12. And kind of the, the key point of, of our study this morning is that these um, false apostles that he's going to speak about in the next chapter he says, we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. 
So these false apostles, they love to compare themselves, not with the divine standard as exemplified in the person of Christ, but with other men using human standards. They were promoting themselves and their teachings as superior to Paul's, but they also had this kind of competition among themselves. Yeah, a bit like the disciples. Remember when the Lord was talking about uh, going to the cross and and they were discussing among themselves who should be the greatest in the kingdom. And so these false apostles are there making these comparisons and they're measuring themselves by themselves. And he did not want to be affiliated with such teachers. He said, these people are not wise. They're without understanding. They are evaluating themselves in the wrong standard. This spirit of competition among them measuring themselves by themselves, comparing themselves among themselves was such an unwise thing. And, and their, their standard, they're going no higher than themselves. It was all self. By the way, that's so human, isn't it? Uh, doing evangelism and door-to-door -door work. Uh, I've had people say to me, oh, you need to go to the projects or you need to go to, in other words, they were comparing themselves with people in a, a different neighborhood as if to say, that's who you got to go and look at. And that's not wise. And I would say to them, comparison is not with your neighbor. It's with Christ. Right? He's the standard. <laughs> How do you do in compared to him? And uh, this is what these people do. And they're comparing themselves. And in doing that, one man might be distinguished by this feature or another feature. They're comparing themselves one with another. And uh, it, it was just a, a fool's paradise, really. It's all pride-orientated and uh, pruning their feathers like peacocks. I'm, I'm more eloquent than this one or whatever. And Paul would not dream of joining this mutual admiration society. And it's so common in our day. We live in a day and age where comparing ourselves is just the way people think. Many young people on social media get into all kinds of problems because uh, somehow they feel they don't measure up to what's presumed to be cool at any given time. And they don't have the right looks or they're not in with the right crowd or they're not wearing the right fashion. And so uh, young people, some of them driven to despair because they're, they're making these comparisons uh, on social media. Uh, we could have that amongst ourselves, that spirit of competition comparing ourselves among ourselves. Even preachers can be guilty of that. And it's, it's just folly. It's not wise. Uh, it, it's just ridiculous to do that. But that's exactly what was going on amongst these false teachers. They're, they're always comparing themselves among themselves. And of course, as they compared themselves with him, you know, this, this short uh, Jew that didn't look very impressive and didn't use great eloquence. Well, he he didn't do very good at all. He was a nobody as far as they were concerned, but they, oh, they were the elite class. And so this is exactly what they're involved in. And sadly, uh, it didn't end at Corinth. And it's very, very common and very devastating in our day. And, uh, and, and we've also come to it. I remember being uh, one time at, a, at an Ontario Elders and Workers Conference, and I was listening to to two incredibly gifted brothers preach. And the ministry was just amazing. And I was thinking to myself, what am I even doing? Why am I even involved in the ministry at all? And, and then I suddenly caught myself short. You know, God has gifted these men. Praise God for that. But, but he wants to use a, a one-talent man just as much as he wants to use a ten-talent man. And we just got to be content with who we are and the sphere of ministry God has given us and serve him by his grace uh, while we have opportunity and be delivered from the snare. And it is a snare of comparing ourselves with others and be content with the way God has made us and the ministry God has given us. Now, I want you to notice something uh, as we look at uh, these verses, uh, particularly down to verse 16, uh, the key phrases that are repeated. And uh, in the King James, we've got in verse 12, 
measuring themselves. In verse 13, it talks about our measure, but according to the measure. And then it talks about the rule. We'll think about that one too. And then a measure, again, to reach verse 14. It's in italics, not in the original, but I think is fitting in the contract context. We stretch not ourselves beyond our measure. Verse 15, not boasting of things without our measure. And again, at the end of verse 15, you've got that word rule again. And then verse 16, you've got the word line to preach the gospel in regions beyond you and not boast in another man's line of things. So obviously, as you look at this, we've got to think about what does he mean by measure and rule and line? And so I want to think about these words. First of all, I want to think about them in the original language. The word measure in Greek is where our English word meter comes from, right? You measure in meters. So it's speaking really of uh, a geographical measurement. That's the idea. We're measuring something. How big is it? What area does it cover? It's a measurement. And then the word line and rule in the King James, actually the same word in the Greek. And it's the, the word canon as the canon of scripture. Remember, we talk about uh, the 66 books that, that make up the canon of holy scripture. And that word canon, again, is a, is a measurement word. And it, it's the idea of, does it measure up to the standard as they were evaluating people were being being killed for possessing manuscripts of the new testament the manuscripts were being taken off them and they were being murdered they were being killed by the state and so you wanted to be sure if you're going to die you don't want to die for a spurious document <laughs> right i don't want to die for the apocrypha but I, uh, or, or some spurious writing. But I, I'm, if it's the word of God, yes, I'm willing to lay down my life for that. And so there were certain criteria that were laid out amongst the people of God as to whether something me measured up to, tr to Scripture. Maybe we can think about uh, some of those things in the Q&A. What, what were the standards, the measurements, as to determine whether something was, was part of the, the canon of scripture or not. But anyway, for our purposes, we don't want to get, <laughs> be easy to get sidetracked right now. I don't want to do that. I want to stick with our passage. And so uh, really the, the whole context seems to be to do with, with measurements and, dis, and measuring up. Does it measure up to the standard? And, um, and certainly the word measure has the idea of a geographical area measured out and we believe designated by God for Paul and his ministry. Uh, and so we want to keep that in mind. I wonder, does Paul have in mind, by the way, uh, a, a verse in Job? Let's just go back to Job just for a second. All this talk of measure and line. If we, if we look in the book of Job in chapter 38, as, as God reveals himself to Job, and particularly reveals himself in creation. He says, verse 5 of Job 38, Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, who laid the cornerstone thereof? Speaking of creation. And so in terms of the old creation, it seems that God works by measure and by line. In other words, everything is measured out by God. And of course, we have a, an amazing uh, example of that uh, in terms of the location of our planet. Did God get his measurements right? If it was closer to the sun, we'd be burnt to a crisp, right? I think he got the measurement just right. If, he, if it was too far away, from the sun, we'd, we'd freeze. It's in exactly the perfect place. Is God good at measurements? Oh, I think he's absolutely f fantastic at measurements, right? So everything was done by measurement by line as far as the old creation is concerned. And is Paul saying 
that God works under the same principle when it comes to the new creation, his administration of grace. Everything's measured out. Everything's lined up. And so what does it mean practically? Well, the line that God had allotted to him was a very extensive one. God had given Paul a, a sphere of ministry, okay? He had measured out to him a sphere of service that took in the entire Gentile world. That was the measure, the circumference of his ministry. God in his sovereignty had measured out a field, a course of service for him, and he had proved to all who cared to judge him that he had not failed in his charge. And again, you think of God's ways. Why would God pick this man and give him this field, the Gentile world? Like, isn't he a Hebrew of the Hebrews? Wasn't he raised by Gamaliel? I mean, didn't he have insights into Judaism far beyond his peers? I mean, if you were, if you were measuring out the line, what would you have given Saul of Tarsus? I'll guarantee you'd have said he's the perfect man for reaching the Jews. I think we'd all agree with that, right? But God says, mm -mm, that's not how I work. My ways are not your ways. I'm going to pick him and send him to the Gentiles. That's just totally contrary to how we would think. And again, I mentioned, I think, in a previous uh, study that God picked D.L. Moody, uh, a shoe clerk uh, who butchered the English language and sent him to Cambridge University to reach the cream of the intellects of England. We would have said, no, 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 no. He's not the guy, Lord. What are you thinking? Why would you pick him? Uh, I would never pick D.L. Moody and send him to Cambridge. God says, uh-uh, my ways are not your ways. And, and again, I want to demonstrate to you that the excellency of the power is not of us, but it's of God. And so that's how God works. That's the lines upon which he works. Totally different to ours. Praise God for that. Praise God that he doesn't work according to our line of things. Uh, he has his own ways of working, and that's how he works. And so just remind ourselves of Paul's commission, uh, Acts 9. Uh, and verse 15, he says, The Lord said to him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. But first and foremost, he is the apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, Book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 5. Again, this line that's been laid out for him. By whom? We have received grace and apostleship for the obedience to the faith among all nations. Goyim, all Gentiles, for his name. And so that was the sphere that God had called Paul to. That was his line of things. And his opponents had no warrant for what they were doing. These False apostles, Judaizers, had come out of Jerusalem, and they were like cuckoos, never building a nest, but taking over one built by other birds. <laughs> they, were, they were on his territory, in his patch, moving in on his patch. Paul had been com commissioned by the Lord to take the gospel to the Gentiles. That commission would, of course, include Corinth or dominated by gentiles and yet and the apostles in jerusalem had agreed to this but now false teachers were coming out from jerusalem and invading the provinces which god had given to the apostle paul and so he says uh, in verse uh, 13 we will not boast of things without our measure but according to the measure of the rule which god has distributed to us a measure to reach even to you. This, this, this territory laid out by God, including the Gentile world, right as far as Corinth. And not just Corinth, because he wants to go beyond that. He says, for we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reach not unto you. 
for we are come as far as you to you in the preaching of the gospel of Christ. And so yeah, we've come as far as you, but they want to go. Be, he wants to go beyond. He would actually like to go beyond them. We're going to see that in verse 16 to preach the gospel in regions beyond you. But there was something holding up him going further into Gentile territory. And like any good general, he must make sure that the ground already possessed was consolidated before he can venture further ahead. And right now, Corinth, the ground there is shaky because of these false apostles coming in. And so what he's really implying is, I want to go further. I want to fulfill the, the ministry the Lord has given me. I want to go much further, but I can't really go much further at the moment because the territory that we've already got some of it is already under attack by the enemy and is unstable. And that's because of these false apostles that have, have come in. And so verse 15, he says, not boasting of things without our measure, that is of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. And so the Corinthians, um, Paul could say to them in his first epistle, um, that they didn't have many fathers. They only had one father. He was their father in the gospel, right? He had brought the gospel to them. First Corinthians 4, let me just read it, verse 15. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers? For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. And so, he was the, the one who had brought the gospel to them. He had come to them. He had labored amongst them in divine power. And yet, he is limited in going further. Because um, he has to wait for their faith to be increased. Notice he says, But having hope when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly we'll be able to go further uh, we'll be able to to move on out beyond and uh, that's what they're doing and so um wanting to go forward but he can't because he's he's held up by them uh he needs them to 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 get stable paul uh didn't boast in other men's work he didn't venture uh, into other men's fields. He went into unplowed fields. He was a pioneer through and through. But others had come into his patch and they destabilized the work. And he, he said, until your faith is solid, I can't really go any further. Uh, he felt that they could really help him in going further if they could become stabilized. And perhaps he had in mind the example of Philippi. See, when he left Philippi, he left them in a stable condition. And not only so, he went out from them almost like a platform to move further. And they supported him in his labors. Look at Philippians 4, this verse 15 as an example. He says, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity. And so what he envisages for the Corinthian believers is what he's seen in Philippi. Not only did the work become established in Philippi, but it became a beachhead to send the gospel into further regions, from them into Thessalonica, and they even were supporting him in that work. And that's exactly what he desired for the Corinthians. But he couldn't uh, progress, really, until their faith increased, until they had become stable and solid and were allowing him to move on. Uh, their stunted growth in faith was hindering the hopes of advancement being fulfilled. And again, we've got to analyze and ask our own hearts. Are we stunting the growth of the gospel because 
we're, we're not stable spiritually. I wonder how many assemblies ought to be a lot further on than they are and really stable and solid and, and being used as a platform to go into other areas. But because things have come in amongst us, it's, it's kind of on solid ground. And could I be part of that problem? Am I, am I hindering the enlargement of the work because I'm, I'm, such, I'm demanding so much attention from the people of God uh, and from the servants of God that it's, it's hindering the flowing of the gospel? So Paul says in verse 16, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. Paul's eyes of evangelistic zeal looked beyond Corinth to more distant regions beyond them where he expected yet more abundantly to preach the gospel. In the epistle to the Romans, he speaks about having fully preached the gospel of Christ from Jerusalem round about to Illyricum, which was what we now know as Albania, at the shores of the Adriatic. And ultimately, he went to Rome. And so we see that Paul had this true pioneer spirit. He, he didn't want to go into other fields where other men labored. He, he, he saw all the fields that were out there, and he wanted to just keep moving on to, to regions beyond. And the true evangelist, the true pioneer, always eyes the regions beyond. Again, I'm reading Betty McMullen's book and reading about, is it Isaac McMullen and his labors and uh, how he, he was in Boston, and then he heard about this, this field called New Brunswick and uh, that it was an open field and he moved up there and labored, but he didn't just stay there. He also, I was reading this morning, went to Nova Scotia, uh, uh, to Cambridge and he had evangelistic meetings there and not just there, he went even into Newfoundland. Uh, I mean, he was constantly pushing the limits and that's that pioneer spirit. And sadly, in many of our assemblies, that pioneer spirit is lost. It's all about just protecting our little patch, kind of uh, working on our little territory. And, and we need to, once again, lift up our eyes. We need to say, Lord, raise up some pioneers again who will go into new fields. Now, Paul was an evangelist, but he tells us he never went and entered and took over ground cultivated by other laborers, as his enemies at Corinth had done. He didn't want to boast in another man's line of things that was ready to their hands. You know, it's so much easier just to go in when already there's a foundation laid. And, and that's what these guys had done in Corinth. No, he, he wanted to go to new areas. Now, we're not implying in any way that Paul had no regard for other servants of God who sought to edify converts because that was their ministry. We've already seen in this very epistle, he had high value on Titus and the impact Titus had had on the Corinthians and how the Corinthians loved him and appreciated him. And Timothy, he would send Timothy to Ephesus and to other places where there was a need of, of ministry that would build up the saints. So he's not saying there's no place for people going around the existing assemblies to build up the saints. He's not saying that, but what he is saying is that these invaders who had come into his territory in Corinth, they were not there for the good of the saints. They had their own selfish ends. Their presence at Corinth, instead of being a help, was a hindrance to the progress of the saints. And they were just trying to gather disciples after themselves and not after Christ. So kind of maybe summarizing those thoughts just for a moment, making it practical for our day. We still need people who can circulate amongst assemblies with edifying ministry that will build up the saints. We need that. No question about it. And we, we seem to have 
we have that in many ways. A lot of the ministry that's taken place today is amongst existing assemblies and it's needful and we thank God for it. But what's lacking today is the spirit that's seen in the apostle Paul to go to the regions beyond. Where are the J.T. Dixons of our day, the, uh, the, the pioneers who are plowing new fields, going to areas where there's no testimony, going to areas where, uh, yeah, there's not the limelight. You don't get the, maybe the pats on the back and all the rest of it. It's a lonely field and it's a hard field. There a lot of hardship involved, but we're going to see that in Paul's ministry. But he was willing for that and uh, delighted in that. And he did not want to go into another man's line of things. So he says in verse 17, and this is very important. He's quoting from Jeremiah chapter 9. Let's just look back there for a moment. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 9. And he's, he's quoted it in his first epistle to it. Obviously, something very deeply on the heart of the apostle. Jeremiah 9, 23. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercises loving kindness and judgment and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. And so Paul says here, really having that verse in mind, uh, and uh, he says, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now look at 1 Corinthians as well, just to see that he uses it uh, in his first epistle too. I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 31 that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And so Paul has just been forced, in a sense, into entering into boasting by his opponents. He, he would never dream of such a thing. Wouldn't be, it would be the farthest thing from his mind. But because they have been diminishing him and ridiculing his ministry uh, and uh, he feels that he needs to defend his apostolic authority, defend his ministry because it's under attack in his own backyard where he had labored, where he had planted the work. But at the end of the day, he wants to say this, listen, any good that came out of anybody's life is only because of the Lord. And if we're going to glory, the only glory that we can do is glory in the Lord. And again, I'm reminded, of Psalm 115. And again, this, this should be so true of all of us. Whatever line of ministry God has given to us, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. And so had it not been for his rivals at Corinth compelling him, to boast. He would never have ever indulged in such a practice. In fact, he tells us elsewhere that the only thing he ever wants to boast in is Jesus Christ and him crucified. But he's been drawn into this. He's had to defend his authority and, he, and he's done so. But he says, listen, if there's any boasting, let him glory in the Lord. He that glory, let him glory in the Lord. And then verse 18, he says, for not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. So they were good at commending themselves, comparing themselves, commending themselves. But he says the only approval that matters at all is the Lord's approval. It's so easy for us, just like the Pharisees. Let me read from John 5, verse 44. Very interesting uh, scripture that the Lord, as he talks to the Pharisees, and again, I, I believe these Judaizers were more modeled on the Pharisee model than they were on the model of Christ. He says, Jesus himself testified, 
it's the wrong verse. Looking at chapter five, chapter five, verse 44. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that comes from God alone? And so he's telling us that really the only honor that matters is the honor that comes from God. The only approval, the only commendation that ultimately is going to matter is this, that when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, will we hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. It doesn't matter what men thought of us, what esteem men held us in their eyes, that, that's not going to matter anything. But what is he going to say to us? And so, not he that commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. So just by way of application, I'm going to try and pull these things together quickly. First of all, do we know the sphere of ministry that God has given to us? What is our geographical ministry? Are, are we faithful to the Lord in executing it? Do we know where God has placed us? What work he's given us to do? And are we seeking to execute it to the glory of God? Secondly, do we have a tendency to compare ourselves with others, maybe in a prideful way? Sometimes it's very easy to compare ourselves with people who are lower than us and think, well, at least I'm not like him. Or, again, it's still wrapped up in self, compare ourselves with people who are more eloquent than us and say, well, woe is me. It's still self-focus. The only comparison that we should be doing is comparing ourselves with the perfect servant. And if we compare ourselves faithfully with the perfect servant, we'll always stay humble <laughs> and we'll always recognize, boy, I'm nowhere near where I ought to be. And we won't be carried away with our own importance. And then are we people that build up the people of God or are we people that tear down? Sometimes it is necessary to tear down false reasonings, false ideas, but do we demolish and then just leave a heap of rubble or are we able then to replace the false philosophies and build people up on the perfect foundation of Christ? Because there's no other foundation that can be laid than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And then is our supreme motive for service the glory of God? Are we people that are thinking, Lord, how can I bring most glory to you today? How can I make you look good in this world? How, how can I magnify your name, that those that love thy salvation and say continually, the Lord be magnified, not me, him. Let him be magnified. And then do we have a sense of contentment with how God has made us and how he's gifted us and where he has placed us? Now, I think there's, there's a, a legitimate discontentment in this sense that, Lord, I want to be more holy. Lord, I want to be more useful to you. Right? I'm not content with the status quo. I long for greater usefulness. Yes. But I can't add an inch to my stature. Right? God has made me like this. And so I have to be content with who I am with the, the intelligence and the gifting God has given me and the place that he has put me, I have, to be, I have to learn to bloom where I have been planted for his glory. And so may God encourage us as we consider uh, this very practical section, I believe, uh, for, again, and that desire that should grip our hearts, that he alone should receive all the glory. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm.